Dr. Mulder, let me start with you. Uh, of course, you're going to get these questions. Uh, people are going to say, where, where, where is Peter Mulder today? Do you know where he is? Of course I know where he is. He's busy with his official duties. There's a, a policy conference of the department, uh, not the department, but of Agri-SA in Stellenbosch that started at 8 o'clock this morning, and he's attending that. He's doing his job. All right. There are calls for him to resign. Uh, uh, do you know what his thinking is around those calls? There's no reason why he should resign at all. Maybe we should start at the beginning. Um, when President Zuma came to power in, in 2009, he uh, extended an invitation to him to join the executive as a deputy minister. Now, at that stage, you'll remember that agriculture and land reform was basically the same department. We made it clear to the president that we have strong views with regard to land reform and that we are not uh, going to serve in that capacity. And uh, consequent to that, the two departments were basically split. We've now got a different department. The Department of Agriculture is one uh, section dealing basically with food security and the whole question of farmers, Mm -hmm. and then a different department dealing with land reform. So he's serving as the Deputy Minister of Agriculture, and he's not dealing with land reform in that capacity. So with regard to the um, uh, call from the Communist uh, Youth League or whatever for him to resign, um, there's no reason for him to do so. He was he's serving in the executive on the invitation of the president. If the president doesn't want that to be the case, then the president should uh, draw his invitation. But the president, of course, warned uh, uh, Dr. Mulder last week about his utterances on this, which obviously implies that the president uh, does not approve of his comments on this matter. Well, m- maybe a debate like this this morning is absolutely necessary, and maybe another debate in parliament is even more necessary so that we can go back to exactly what was said and that we can take the emotions out of this and, and come to what exactly was said, not what people think. Okay, said. tell us tell us what was said and why. Well, uh, the fact of the matter is that um, the President in his State of the Nation address basically referred to the question of uh, land distribution and land reform, and he made the statement that the concept of willing buyer, willing seller is not a successful concept. Yeah. Now, that has huge implications for land, and if we say that land is an emotive issue, it's emotive for all South Africans, not for one section of the population. And let's be clear, it wasn't the first time the president said that. He said it in 2009. Yes, but he said this now in his State of the Nation address, and we all know that the ANC is on its way to its policy conference in the middle of this year, so we know where we are going. Then the president also said, basically, that um, he gave certain percentages. He said that 87% of the land belongs to whites, which we dispute. It's not correct. And he said only 8% of land has so far been successfully uh, distributed to, to, to the black population, figures that we do not agree with. <clears throat> and then basically, he, in his, my, uh, the, 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 the Peter Mulder in his speech basically referred to those figures, and he said that he disagreed with those figures, and he thinks they are wrong. And if the department takes that as a point of departure, they're setting themselves up to fail even before they start. And then he took a historical perspective by saying how things developed in South Africa, and unlike as being reported all the time, he never said, not for one second said, that certain areas of South Africa were uninhabited before the white people came here. He never said that. So we can go into those details as well. No, no, just clarify for us. What did he say then? Around around the Bantus and the 40% that they are not He didn't to refer to the Bantus. Bantu I know speaking. that is also being said. He yeah, referred he... to an academically linguistic used phrase. Bantu-speaking people. Bantu languages. Yeah. And that is an academic term for people who moved from Central Africa down south. That's it. And I mean, we can talk about that as well. And he basically said, and I can quote exactly what he basically said. Let me just get that exact part. Yeah, um, he said, Africans in particular, and he referred to the ANC's kind of definition that they use. They talk about black people in general and Africans in particular when it suits them. He said, Africans in particular never, pa- never in the past lived in the whole of South Africa. And that is what's been claimed. But he said, never lived in the whole of South Africa. The Bantu-speaking people, referring to that academic term, moved from the equator down, while the white people moved from the Cape up to meet each other at the Kay River. There is sufficient proof that there were no Bantu-speaking people in the Western Cape and Northwestern Cape. Yeah. And then he said these parts form 40% of the Africa's land surface. That's what he said. Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, I don't see any contradiction with what's being reported because people are saying, well, he said there's, no, there's proof that no Bantu-speaking people uh, occupied the Western and the Northern Yes, Cape. because it was occupied by the Khoi and the Sun at that stage. Uh, uh, and, then, and, then, and then he says that they, 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 the Bantu-speaking people then have no claim in about 40% of the country. No, he did not say that. But by implication? No, don't, no, don't, okay. don't, no, no by implication. Mm-hmm. He did not say that. We should stick to what was said in this debate. The, I mean, Western, all right, all right. the Western and the Northern Cape constitute about how much of South Africa? 40%. Yeah, so what it means is that that 40% was never occupied by the Bantu-speaking people. Well, if that's the, well, let's look into it. Do you think there's a possibility that it may, might be true? Tell me, is it true? 
Well, the history book says it's true. Whose history book? Oh, well, now this is another debate. We can go about that. You bring your books, I'll bring my books. No, but I mean, tell me, who, who, whose history book are you referring to? We, <laughs> we look at the reality of South Africa. Mm-hmm. Why, why even today does the, 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 the brown community, or the, or the descendants of the Khoi and the Sun people, form a majority in the Western Cape and the Northwestern Cape? Why would that be the case? That's it. We can go into that kind of historical argument. The fact of the matter is, you would never say that South Africa was unoccupied for 40%. He reacted to the claim and the definition used by the ANC when they talk about blacks and Africans in particular, and he used their own definition to say, but for 40% of the land in South Africa, they were not residing there. Hmm. All right, let me bring my other guest then. Uh, uh, Christy, what did you make of, of uh, the speech? Uh, and, and obviously, what are you hearing? Because I don't see any difference between what has been reported over the past couple of days and what exactly Dr. Mulder is saying now. No, I'm, I'm also not noticing any particular difference. Um, what I think for me is, is of, of significance here is why this is being brought up right now. Because the fact of the matter is what, what I'm noticing here is something that fits into a pattern that we've seen since 1994, which is where white people, through um, what we call white denialism, try to actually deny certain aspects of, of, of current levels of privilege. This is not for me actually so much about the historical aspect. History um, can be used and abused you know, in whichever way one, one wants to, ultimately. The, the question is why now, in this particular, at this juncture, 18 years into democracy, are we hearing this argument being made? And I think it's, it's actually part of, it's a, it's a strategy to t- try and delegitimize black people's claim on the one hand, and to re-legitimize white people's claim on current levels of, of privilege that are held by, by white people. So, um, so we're seeing actually use of history to, to again create the kind of hierarchy of access. Because say, say um, um, for argument's sake, we can prove that there weren't a single black person in what's today in the Western Cape and the Northern Cape a um, hundred years ago, which I think is unlikely. But um, so we can prove that. Uh, what, what does that mean, basically? That means that we, we get back into that very same arguments, into those very same arguments that we used in the colonial and the apartheid era of where there's a hierarchy of access that's being established. So, so uh, we'll have to split the country into two, and we'll have to say, you know, so-called colored people and white people now have, you know, can, can have land in the Western Cape and the Eastern Cape, and then um, I assume that the um, Freedom Front Plus then suggests that White people who own land in the rest of the country should let go of that land. I don't know, but it would be interesting to hear what their suggestion is there. Um, You know, so when one gets into the absurdity of that. So for me, it's actually not about the practical implications of what's being said, because it's it's ridiculous. It's actually more about trying to create a a, um, a legitimization of white people's claims as they exist. Hmm. What I would rather see Mm -hmm. is, is is a situation where we see, where we say that what we have in this country is a situation of successive waves of immigrants arriving here throughout the centuries. And the first um, people from the rest of the continent, not from Europe, but from the rest of the African continent that, that arrived here, for example, was in the 4th century AD. So not, not quite the Freedom Front Plus would, 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 would want it. Um, so from that point onwards, we see successive waves of immigrants arriving here. And I would say everybody who lives in this country today have an equal claim and stake. Mm. But as we know, colonial, colonialism and apartheid have denied black people their, their equal claim and stake you know, and in this country. And today we need corrective action, and that is what land re- redistribution and, and restitution is about. Steve, uh, what is your take on this matter? Thanks, Colonel, for the opportunity. You know, I think when I, I was actually first told about, about this debate, my sense was that we were going to debate the historical validity of the claim that was made by uh, Melder in Parliament last week. And I think the public's reaction is actually based on and is a true reflection of what the statement actually implied. And this, this has been an age-old kind of you know, Africana argument about you know, probably justifying a series of political uh, scenarios in South Africa you know, historically. Mm. And I think the latest would be to justify the creation of homelands, you know, the same argument had actually been used. And it is no, you know, it, it is no surprise today 
that the Freedom Front would still be using the argument that 40% of, of the Western Cape and Northern Cape were not populated by, you know, Bantu or African, whatever term we want to use. But I think we are missing the point here. Yeah. And the point is that, you know, there has been interaction between different people historically. You know, there has been interaction between the Koi and the Sen. You know, at, at interaction which at some point, you know, would have taken away any differences between the two. And hence, we could actually talk at, at some point, you know, at the height of this interaction, as the Sen being Koi without cattle, and Koi being Sen with cattle. And the same kind of interaction would have happened between the Gunukwebe Kosa and the Koi. And that kind of interaction simply reflects, you know, the, the level of, of the capacity for absorption that the Koi and the, and, and, and the Kosa would have had. Mm. So it becomes actually irrelevant that we, we must be talking about who between the Koi and the Kosa populated the Western Cape and the Northern Cape. You know, because you are talking about societies that had a high degree of capacity for absorb, you know, absorbing each other's cultures and probably undermining certain identities that wouldn't help, you know, kind of cooperation between the two. Yeah. This has not been the case with European settlers. You know, 300 years down the line, you know, whites are whites and blacks are blacks. You know, you can never say, you know, blacks are whites without money or whites are blacks with money because simply because, you know, it, it essentially it, this, it, it doesn't happen. Those kinds of barriers never actually get broken down. So my sense here is that the, it's pointless to try and make a distinction between the Koi Sen and the Kosa, you know, for purposes of this debate, you know, because we are talking about, you know, people who over time have actually created a particular kind of, of culture, you know, that, uh, that makes them survive. Hmm. Interaction between the Koi Sen and the Europeans is well known, you know, probably you know, some of it actually ended with a couple of epi uh, smallpox epidemics for the Koi. Okay. And almost, you know, total annihilation of, of, of the Koi and Sen as people. Now, that's not the sort of thing that, you know, Africans would do when they interact with people. And I think it's a kind of projected psychology, you know, on the part of, of the Freedom Front that Bantu should have done to the Koi Sen what they did you know, at the point of interaction. And this is another thing that we probably have to debate.